Not sure exactly how to follow that. Um, but you know, I was thinking of Bill, of course, he speaking of having been in South Africa. And to be frank, when I think of South, South Africa, the first thought that comes to my mind is apartheid. And of course, I know that was fr from the past. And then we have this amazing message and, and this song from Chris. And, um, that's the blessing of God's church is that here is where it's different. Here is where God shines through. It's his family. There's no place like it on earth. And uh, so grateful for that. I'm going to uh, kind of follow suit in, in this regard. So first of all, I, I appreciate the, the vulnerability um, to share that. And, and just to sing a song like that, to, to pour your heart out like that, is just being honest and real. And for me, over the last month, it seems like, or maybe longer, I've been studying out and thinking about this idea of vulnerability. Um, and it's, it's really, and, I, and, I, and sometimes I've asked myself why. It's like, well, I was a twin, identical twin. Maybe it has something with being in the womb together, and there's this right bond before we were born. And so I have this kind of deep need to be close. And yet, that is not unique to me. We all have this desire and need to be close and to have deep relationships. And so I've been thinking about studying about vulnerability. But in doing so, and as I was looking at the scriptures, it just basically has brought me back to how God has revealed himself. I was thinking about the, the desire and the need for, as a family, for us to be vulnerable with one another. And as I studied out the scriptures, it just brought me to how God has revealed himself. So I'm going to share some of those thoughts with you. It's interesting, the, uh, if I say the name Brene Brown, most of you have heard of Brene Brown. And she wrote a book, 2012, almost 10 years ago, called uh, Daring Greatly. And it was all about vulnerability. And since then, she's written a total of six books, all number one New York Times bestsellers. She has uh, a TED Talk that is in the top five TED Talks worldwide. And she has become a consultant to the Bill Gates Foundation, to uh, Pixar, and to the Seattle Seahawks. All right, that little disjointed. Bottom line is she's spoken about vulnerability and this is, all of a sudden, it was like whew, six books, top books in the world, TED Talk, top five, and now she's a consultant to Bill Gates and his foundation. Because of this idea of vulnerability. And when we think of vulnerability, I, looking up, if you look up Webster, Webster would say it's um, easily hurt being open to attack. And that, I think, is partially what vulnerability is because it opens yourself up, right? That some good things and challenging things could happen. But it's really, it's also, it's stepping into uncertainty. It's stepping into risk and even emotional exposure. And as I studied that out and began looking in the scriptures, I see that Jesus, and, and you, may be, you may have different thoughts of this idea of vulnerability, like, oh my goodness, we're having a sermon on vulnerability? You know, is that, is that biblical? Jesus stepped into uncertainty like none of us ever have. He risked like none of us have. And you talk about opening himself up emotionally to attack and harm. He did. Is our God a vulnerable God? Is God vulnerable? Is he open to attack, harm? Does he step forward in uncertainty, risk? 
in John chapter 20, turn there. John 20, when Jesus appears to Thomas. And by the way, as you're turning there, why my mind has been on this idea of vulnerability is I think about where is God taking our family? What is, what's the future? Where is, where is God moving us collectively as a body? And I think one of, one of the characteristics and truths about God's family that will make us a city set on a hill, a light in this dark world is vulnerability. And I don't mean just vulnerability in the sense of I will confess my sins to you. We'll talk more about that. It's more than that. John 20, verse 24. Now Thomas, also called Didymus, one of the 12, was was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, lest I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. So a week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. This was a life-changing experience for Thomas. And it's interesting that Jesus, when he stands there, he, he tells Thomas, look, Check out the nails. See my hands. And then it says, put your hand into my side. Put your hand into my side. That's because there was a gaping hole because a spear had been thrust through it. And he had the nails in his wrists, his hands. And he was in the tomb for three days and God raised him from the dead. So he was alive, but his body was physical. And he still had the nails, probably large nail holes now from hanging on a cross for hours. And this gaping hole in his side that somehow Thomas could put his hand into his side. Perhaps I mean, if, if that was the case, then he still had serious gouges on his forehead because he had worn a crown of thorns. And so when he stood before the apostles, the disciples, God didn't change him so that he was this beautiful, all put together, no scars. He stood there in his brokenness like he was three days ago. He stood before them broken, right? Marred. Probably bruises still on his face. Three days ago, he had been beaten with a staff. And so here he stands before them. And when Thomas sees that, my Lord and my God. He stood there with the nail holes, bruises, and the cuts. This is what a conquering Messiah looks like. This is what a risen Messiah looks like. In John 1, when Jesus came, it says he came to that which was his own, right? We remember the second part of that verse. He came to those who were his own, but his own what? Did not receive him. They wouldn't recognize him. He came even to his own. No, no, no. Isaiah 53 tells us that Jesus was rejected, despised and rejected by men. Somehow this Messiah that came wasn't 
accepted, probably because he was such a different Messiah than was to be expected. And so when he stood there, risen, with the power of God having raised him from the dead, he still revealed all of his weakness, the frailty that his body just went through. In Mark chapter 8, turn to Mark chapter 8, in verse 27. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi, and on his way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, well, some say you're John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others, you're one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked? Who do you say I am? And Peter answered, you are the Messiah. And Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. And he then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. That There's a demarcation in, in the gospel of Mark from this point forward. They got them. It took them a while, but they got the message. You are the Messiah. You're the promised one who would save us from our sins. And, you know, we, we read it in Matthew. It's like, you know, Peter comes forward, you're the Christ. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. This wasn't revealed to you by man, by man, but by God. It was kind of like, good job, Peter. Awesome. You got it. That's so true. But Mark tells us from that moment on, once they realized you're the Messiah, Jesus began to preach a message to them. And this is what it was. I will suffer many things. I will be rejected. I'll be killed. And he spoke plainly about it. And Peter's response was what? No way. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Jesus, are you kidding me? This is never going to happen to you. You're the Messiah. How could you... No way. You're not going to be rejected and suffer and show weakness and submission and be conquered, be defeated. No way. He rebuked him. And Jesus gave one of the strongest rebukes back ever. Get behind me, Satan. You don't have in mind the things of God. Peter was the when he heard this message, and he probably was just speaking for the other disciples. They, he just spoke up more often than they did. It's like, this is not the kind of Messiah that I signed up for. This suffering Messiah. I wonder, is Jesus who we expect him to be? Is who we, is who Jesus is who we want him to be. Who is Jesus? Who is this Messiah? Bill referenced the scripture that saying today, yesterday, today, tomorrow. You remember when Moses, when he, God had said to Moses, he said, you know, you have found favor with me. I know you by name. So Moses, kind of emboldened by this, wow, God knows me by name, and I've found favor with him. So if that's the case, God, show me. Exodus 34. He's like, okay, if that's the case, then could I ask this? Would you show me your glory? And so he does, right? Hides him in the cleft of the rock, and, and God expresses who he reveals who he is. He says, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate, gracious God. Abounding in love. Forgiving wickedness, rebellion, sin, and maintaining love. So God says, I will tell you, I will show you who I am. And he does. And then 
that's the Old Testament. Moses, show me. And God says, this is, it. This is me. And you remember in John 14 when it's, it's near the Last Supper, and he's having that time with his disciples, and he's like, I'm going to be going away. And they're like, we don't get it. Where are you going? Would you just show us? And then Philip says, said, would you just show us the Father? And that'll be enough. Just show us the Father, and that'll be enough. Jesus says, seen me? You've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. In fact, you have seen the Father because you've seen me. And so the point is, is that we have to let God define who he is. How God reveals himself through Christ to be. Moses was like, okay, you show me. And this, and God got to reveal who he was. Moses wasn't painting the picture of this is who God is. God said, okay, I will tell you. This is who I am. And then when, when Philip says, just, just show us the Father. I want to see who God is. I want to see what God is really like. Just show us. That'll be enough. It's kind of like kids. I want to ask another question. If, if you just give me this, and Jesus is okay, but you've seen, you're looking at the Father because you've seen me. We have to be comfortable letting God define who he is and what he is like. Is God a vulnerable God? We have to pursue God's vision and revelation of himself. And not just pursue it. We have to love it. We need to love who God reveals himself to be. Who we will be as a church has everything to do with who we see God be. Everything. And so, God, show us. And, and that's the amazing thing, right? We could... We could spend 10,000 sermons who God is and have just scratched. So I don't pretend to say in one sermon we're going to define God. That's not going to happen. But we have, let's let God show us some things about him. Because, again, God's vision and revelation of himself should inform who we are as a church. Not culturally, as Bill mentioned, not from familial impact, but let God define who he is and therefore who we as a family should be. Because right, 1 John 2, 6, anyone who claims to live in him must what? Walk as he walked. The whole, we read the scriptures we see constantly, we're to imitate God. The imitators of God were to imitate Christ, were to become like him. And so therefore, the church is as God reveals himself, who we will be as a church. And that's my question. Who will we be a year from now as a family? What will the Knoxville church look like? Not only in number, but what will the Part of the Knoxville church. When someone comes and, and is with us and they drive home and they think, what is this church? What will they see? Jesus, I have two points. Jesus is infinitely vulnerable. And secondly, Jesus is eternally weak. Jesus is infinitely vulnerable. He shows us it's okay to put yourself in a place that's uncertain, to put yourself in a place where you might be hurt. No, 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 no. I can't do that. I won't. I am. 
But isn't Jesus our example? Now, Jesus, Jesus, we're doing our best. We have the Holy Spirit. This is not about perfection, but our aim could be to be like Christ. John 13, turn to John 13. Jesus is ultimately, he is infinitely vulnerable. John 13. He is, well, let's just, let's read one through nine. It was just before the Passover festival, Jesus, so this, it's Thursday night for the crucifixion on Friday. It was just before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. He had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around them. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, Jesus replied, you don't realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No. You shall never wash my feet, said Peter. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus is in the upper room, and it's called the Last Supper because it is. Last Supper with his best friend. The last one. And so he initiates supper together. And of course, it's, he tells us, do this. While he's begun this dinner together, this supper, which was not a, kind of like I eat and I'm done. This was a time together, hours. So he's having this dinner with them. And then as they're having this meal, he admits to them that he's going to be betrayed. In the midst of this dinner, he says, it's going to happen. One of you will betray me. And we know what what the disciples do. They're like, they're asking one another, is is it me? And and then Peter says, John, John, ask me who it is. Dips his hand. They still didn't get it. But so they're having this dinner. Jesus tells them, one of you is going to betray me tonight. The disciples are sad. They're questioning. They're shocked. And then, amazingly, this conversation about who's going to betray you morphs into who's the greatest. Oh, I wouldn't. There's, it wouldn't be. Not, you kidding me? Not me, because I'm faithful. No, I'll stand by him. Oh, you think you would? I, I'll do anything for Jesus. No, I am, because because I'm the greatest. No, I'm the. You're you're not the greatest. I'm the. They got into an argument. Dinner. Who is the greatest? And then. Jesus is about to go cross, and his very best friends are arguing about who's the greatest. But I want you to under, listen. What you know, God never wastes words in the scriptures. And so, this John who writes this later, look at the kind of preamble to Jesus washing their feet. Verse one. 
says it was just before the Passover festival, and Jesus knew that the hour had come. I want you to think about what's in Jesus' mind before he actually gets up to wash their feet. One, he knew. Hours near. They didn't know it. He did. It's going to happen. The hour has come. This is the hour, the moment that I have come and lived for. And then he, he says that he loved his own. Jesus loved them desperately. And then it says he knew that God had put all things under his power. Jesus knew that he had the agency to do whatever. It was his choice. It was his decision on what was going to happen because God said, it's, it's, it's you. You're the one who's going to give your life, but it's your choice. Jesus knew that God had put all things under his, his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. Jesus knew who I am. I came from God. I'm returning to God. The point, all this, he's like, why is God, John repeating all these things about what Jesus knew before? Why preface it so much? I think it's because of this. Is that Jesus self consciousness who he was, revealed itself when he stepped forward to walk. Like, yep, the hour's come. God's put everything in my hands. I love these guys. I've, came, I've come from God. I'm returning to God. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to wash their feet. Jesus was really exemplifying who he was. He was, and it's amazing because if, if I thought, okay, this is the momentous hour of my life, God has put all agency or decision in my hands. I came from God. I'm returning to God. And then I'm going to step forward and I'm going to do something powerful. I'm going to make a statement. I'm going to preach. I'm going to teach. I'm going to do something that's going to be powerful and, and grab their attention. But instead of that, when Jesus realized all these things, instead... He proved who he was in, not in power, but in weakness. Supposed weakness. He washed the disciples' feet. And for us, we've read it so many times, and it, it may or may not really hit us. And maybe I know that there's a lot of folks who, well, let me just try this one, right? We've heard of it. I've heard of it, but I guess actually have never seen it, nor have I done it. But, but for Jesus, it wasn't just the ceremonial act. Their feet. Jesus' self-understanding revealed itself not in strength, but in weakness. It was humbling. Why, why would Peter react so vehemently? Why would he be? I mean, this is Jesus doing this, and he obviously washed a number of feet before he became, came to Peter. Why would Peter react so strongly? No, never. No, are you kidding me? That's, that is beyond, that is, you are, that's not worthy of who you are. My wife and I were talking the other day. She says sometimes it feels that way getting a pedicure. Like you're getting it, and she's like, I've never had a pedicure, just throwing that out there, um, although I would like to. Um, but, I mean, it, it actually, right, can be a little bit uncomfortable. Someone, you know, they get, they're getting paid. Take care of my toes. So, kind of, and what you might think is, I wouldn't want to do that. This wasn't giving a pedicure. This was Jesus. 
doing what a servant would do. And no Jew, no Jewish servant would do that. And yet, Jesus. And when Jesus was in the upper room that night and he did this, honestly, it was 100% congruent with who God always has been. When Jesus got down and, and washed their feet, and it so turned Peter off, it wasn't like the first time God did something like that. Jesus came to the world. He took the very form of a human being. He took the nature of a born of a woman who was born in a manger. He lived. Yet with Peter, I think we understand that Jesus was, it wasn't just that he was being a servant. He was being vulnerable that day. Risky. He exposed himself. And Peter was embarrassed for Jesus. I don't think that God really cared. His weakness and his vulnerability shocks us. He didn't with Peter. He's like, oh, well, then let me, let me apologize for what I just did. Well, if you don't let me wash you, you have no part in me. God doesn't care if his weakness and his vulnerability shocks us. He won't change who he is. Willingness to open himself up. In fact, the scriptures teach us he triumphed in weakness. First Corinthians, or it's Colossians 2.15, he made a public spectacle powers and authorities because of the cross. Because of the weakness of the cross and the power of the resurrection, he made a public spectacle. Jesus is willing to be vulnerable. Look in Revelation chapter 2. Jesus is infinitely vulnerable with us. He's also eternally weak. As you're looking in Revelation, I want to remind you of a passage in Luke chapter 12. Jesus gives a uh, an illustration. Let me just read this to you as you're, as you're getting to Revelation. He says, Luke chapter 12, it's verse 35. Jesus gives this instruction to his disciples. Be, be dressed and ready for service and keep your lamps burning like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door. It'll be good for those servants whom the master finds them watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve. He will have them recline at the table and he will wait on them. Says the master will dress himself. He'll have them recline at the table. And then he'll go and he'll wait on them. Talking about heaven. When the master returns, the master will serve. Wait a second. That, that can't be right. Didn't Jesus also say, guys, I'm going there to prepare. I'm going to get it ready. When you have guests over to your house, what do you do? You get the place ready. You vacuum, you dust, you whatever. You make the place look good because you're serving. And Jesus says, I'm going there and I'm going to get it all ready. I'm going to prepare this place for you. And here he's saying, the master says, you're going to go recline. I'm going to go. God is always. Wait. In Revelation, I want us to understand and get just a picture, a picture of God. In Revelation, 
um, you know, so John is here and he's, he's having this vision. And once he, he has this vision and he, and he sees almost what's indescribable, he sees God, he sees this throne and he describes it in chapter one, like it's amazing. And then, and then the spirit begins to speak. Jesus actually begins to speak and he, and he talks about the seven churches. And so that's what chapter two and three are, are all about. He talks about these churches and then in in verse or chapter five. Here's what John sees, this vision of heaven. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. So I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll. John is there and, and, and the angel says loudly, who will open the scroll? Who's worthy? And no one in heaven, under heaven, on earth, no one. And John's looking and he's looking and there's nothing and there's no one. And, and he begins, he says, he weeps. I wept and I wept. I wept because no one was worthy to open this. But one of the elders said, don't weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. He says, the lion of the tribe of Judah, he can do it. Verse eight or verse six, very next verse. Then I saw a lamb looking as if he had been slain. He hears, the elder said, the lion of Judah can open it. It's okay, stop crying. The lion of Judah will do it. And so then he looks and he sees a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne. He had a vision of a lion, but what he actually saw was a lamb. What's a lamb? It says, looking as if it had been slain. What does that look like? A lamb looking as if it had been slain. I don't know 100%, but it's a lamb that looks like it's dead, been slain. At the center of the throne, a lamb looking like it had been slain, it's dead. I don't know what that looks like, but standing at the center of the throne, it's this lamb. But wait, you just said the lion of Judah is able. He's able to open the scroll and its seven seals. But if you read all the way through chapter 6 and 7, I watched as the lamb opened. Hmm. Verse 9 of chapter 5, speaking of the lamb, says, And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Verse 12, in a loud voice, they were saying, Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom, and strength and honor and glory and praise. Who's worthy? The lamb that looks like it had been slain. This weak, it's a lamb. It's not the lion of Judah on the throne. It's the lamb looking like it had been slain. And they said, worthy is the lamb to receive power and wealth, and wisdom, strength and honor and glory. The lamb that was slain. Chapter 6, verse 1, as I I watched as the lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then verse 3, when the lamb opened the second seal, 
Verse 5, when the lamb opened the third seal. Verse 7, the lamb opened the fourth seal. Verse 9, the, when he opened the fifth seal. Verse 12, I watched as he opened the sixth seal. Then in chapter 8, verse 1, when he opened the seventh seal, silence in heaven for about a half hour. (laughs) By the way, what has been happening the whole time, don't turn there, but in in chapter 4, verse 8 says, day after, it says, day and night, They never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Holy, holy, again and again and again and again. It's all day, all night. And then when he opened the seven seals, half an hour, (laughs) I half an hour, even to put that in there is like, that's just striking. There was silence for half an hour. It was the Lamb. God, Jesus, when he, when the hour had come and he knew all these things, given me the ability to make the decision, the ability to do this. I, I come from him. I'm going back to him. I love these desperately. Judas is already, de- the devil's already, you know, tempted Judas. We got up, put a towel around him, and he began to wash them. Always, he's always been. What will they think? I'm the Messiah. Because to be the Messiah, ultimately, is to be a lamb, weak. The word, Paul talks about that. They would, people think it was weakness in right, 1 Corinthians. Jesus saves through service, humility, weakness, sacrifice, and vulnerability. And he rules in heaven. He rules as the lamb that was slain on the throne. And all in heaven stopped to praise the lamb that was slain, who was worthy to open. If, and and I understand this, that we're looking at a little bit of God, right? Solomon said that the glory of God to conceal a matter and the glory of kings to search it out, we will be sure. Depths of who God is till we die. Scratching the surface. But God did give us an understanding of Jesus and his willingness to be vulnerable and to be the lamb that was slain. And so I am calling the Knoxville Church to imitate vulnerability. The vulnerability to be open yourself up and you might get open yourself up to your neighbors. Go there. Open yourself up to one another. And be vulnerable, but not just in confessing sin. Please do. That's biblical and that's right. But it's one thing to, let me confess my sin. This is what I did. It's almost like outside of me. It's another thing to say, let me share with you the struggle. Here's the struggle I'm in. Yeah, that's the sin I did, but here's the battle that's going on in my heart. Here's the struggle. I think we easily, much more easily confess our sin than we do the struggle. Because the struggle says I'm weak. The struggle says I'm hurting. The struggle says I don't have all the answers. But sin, I can say that was bad. That was wrong. So let's pray about that. But share the struggle. If we don't, 
who would be a city set on a hill? Brene Brown could write six books on vulnerability. We should be the writers of vulnerability. We should be the authors. Whoops. Sorry, Taj. Well, not broken. That's good. Um, we let's let's go there. Let's be willing to be vulnerable about the struggle. And secondly, not just about the struggle for ourselves, but be willing to struggle with one another. Be vulnerable to serve others in their struggle. That means be willing to get in there. Sit on the sidelines. Be vulnerable to get in the struggle. And some of us, this is the harder part. Be vulnerable enough to let others help you in your struggle. Oh, but I don't have any struggle. Hmm. So I, I just I hope that in seeing just a little bit in Jesus, his vulnerability and in his weakness as the slain lamb, that we will be willing to imitate that heart so that we as a church can truly be a city set on a hill and truly be a church that come, goodness, I found 